in a younger life, our today's speaker, Lee Scribner, was actually a member of the Huntington Reader Services Department. And <laughs> if you'd been here in what year? 98-99. 98-99, would have he would have handed your books to you at the Amundsen desk. So after that high point, <laughs> he went on to get a PhD at the University of London. And he has uh, taught English and Humanities at Bosphorus University, at the University of London Birkbeck College, and at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His new book, Becoming Insomniac, is coming out next week from Paul Gray. So, welcome to the script. Thank, Thank you. Yes, so, so I just must say, I, I was always kind of envious of the readers as working in reader services, and then I was committed to like following you guys, so here I am. Okay. Um, so I'll start. This is, this is basically an, kind of an introduction to the book that I have coming out. And it's kind of hard to encapsulate a book into a 30 or 40, hopefully I'll keep it that short minute lecture. Uh, but uh, this is my attempt. Okay. All right. If recent research is to be believed, cases of insomnia have increased in frequency in recent years, the result of our perpetual connectedness, the round-the-clock media saturations of the Internet age. One commentator on insomnia bemoans the fact that our world is full to the brim with stimulation, bright lights, big screens, alerts and messages, and media in every direction we look. And one of the world's foremost medical journals, Lancet, identifies our increasingly wired culture as a reason for, quote, the dramatic rise in sleep-related complaints. But this idea that revolutions in our media or technological landscape have drastically affected our psychosomatic ecologies to the detriment of our sleep patterns is far older than we might initially suppose. About a century ago, commentators in the popular press complained of insomnia from modern technology in this fashion. The nervous disorder of insomnia has coincided with that general speeding up of life so characteristic a feature of the present day. Insomnia, says Dr. Woods Hutchinson, is a penalty and a pathologic luxury of civilization. I go further. I say that insomnia is essentially a disease of modern civilization, of 19th and 20th century motor car, electric power, super scientific life. <laughs> Yet this sentiment goes further back still to the 19th century, a punch cartoon uh, here from 1877, uh, depicts a common punch character, uh, Paterfamilias and Materfamilias, uh, and they're kept awake by, you know, kind of a prototype of the telephone, uh, and they're getting re messages from Ceylon, uh, Paris, San Francisco, Sydney, uh, listening to their children celebrate the New Year. Um, around this time, a uh, successful Chicago lawyer and satirist, Franklin Head, writes, it has been of late years much the fashion in literature of the subject to attribute sleeplessness to the rapid growth of facilities for activities of every kind. The practical annihilation of time and space by our telegraphs and railroads, the compressing thereby of the labors of months into hours or even minutes, the terrific competition in all kinds of business thereby made possible and inevitable, the intense mental activity engendered in the mad race for fame and wealth, where the nervous and mental force of man is measured against steam and lightning. In this lecture, I intend to trace the 19th century origins of this idea, this notion of technologized insomnia, and show a rationale for why the disorder came into prominence when it, when it did, which will be seen as no accident. Yet our goal here is not to quote unquote prove that communications and transportations technologies cause insomnia in a unilateral way, so much as it is to shed light on some surprising and seemingly overlooked correspondences between insomnia and modern technology. For insomnia is not a mere lack of sleep, but a fundamental paradox of being and willing, where in willing to sleep, we express a will to be without will. This disconnect between the perceived empowerment of willing and the powerlessness of failing to will oneself to cease willing mirrors, technology, <laughs> mirrors technology's off-sighted double logic in which technologies enhance our lives and facilitate our wills on the one hand, but also, on the other hand, secretly subject us to new regimes of servitude, 
One might therefore say, instead of technology causes insomnia, insomnia or sleeplessness, that in seeking but failing to sleep, and in seeking mastery of the technological alike, we exhibit a lack of control that is a function of precisely our desire for control. Insomnia and technological modernity are locked thus in self-perpetuating vicious cycles, and as will be shown, even in mutually exacerbating ones. In his fascinating history of sleep research, Kenton Croker suggests that though it is commonly assumed that insomnia is a universal and unchanging human experience, as is, for instance, breathing, and is largely thus impervious to historical examination, evidence indicates that attitudes about the chronic inability to sleep have changed significantly in recent centuries. In the pre-modern past, during the Renaissance or further back in the Roman period, the term insomnia and its cognates usually meant little beyond what its Latin etymology would suggest, within meaning a negation of somnus, meaning sleep. In other words, it referred simply to the condition of not being asleep. Meanwhile, problematic sleeplessness, usually called watching or wakefulness in the pre-modern Anglophone world, was only considered secondarily as symptomatic of far more significant physical ailments, or indeed emotional or psychological ones. Much of our literary tradition depicts sleeplessness as the result of lovelorn melancholia, Chaucer's Troilus, or a guilty conscience, Shakespeare's Macbeth, or the unfortunate penalty for incurring a god's wrath, as in Theseus Prometheus. All of this changed about a century and a half ago on both sides of the North Atlantic. Suddenly, ranks of newly professionalized neurologists physiologists and psychologists were putting the term insomnia to wider use in reference to chronic sleeplessness, which they began to consider for the first time as a primary disease in its own right and a worthwhile subject for sustained systematic investigation, perhaps not uncoincidentally. Just as this unprecedented professional attention was being turned towards insomnia, a sharp rise in the cases of the disorder began afflicting the public, especially in big cities. One might think it curious that a rise in insomnia happened to coincide with this new scrutiny. But this likely occurred in part as a consequence of the disorder's unusually high degree of suggestibility. Unlike ulcers or arthritis or the flu, but more like contagious yawning, the disorder has long been supposed to be instigated or exacerbated by its mere suggestion. If your doctor is keenly interested in the success of your sleep seeking, you may not perform well under the new pressure. You might, you might, as a result, worry about something to which you had previously paid little attention, which might, in turn, make finding tranquil repose suddenly problematic. There also might have been a kind of perceptual mechanism at play, wherein for the first time the falling forest trees, so to speak, had an audience of attentive ears. In other words, the unprecedented professional attention that began to pay, be paid to insomnia might have had the same effect that expanded seismographs and communications networks have had in making us feel that there are now more earthquakes than ever before. In such considerations of the suggestible nature of this disorder and the likely perceptual mechanisms in diagnosis, we evoke some sense of the Hegelian idea of the contingent nature of discovery, in which the mind always essentially creates what it seeks. Yet we may also consider less theoretical and more concrete malefactors in the sudden rise of disorder. Apart from these suggestive or perceptual mechanisms, it remains significant that many professionals of the Victorian period blamed the epidemic of insomnia on that which had been unmistakably altered since the sleepier days of yesteryear, the character of the urban environment, the faster pace of modern life, i.e. the general technological milieu of what has come to be called the Second Industrial Revolution. Victorians, after all, had their own internet, as Tom Standage has noted. Like other revolutionary inventions, such as the telescope, the telegraph was deemed little more than a child's toy when it was first invented. But after the successful installation of the, in the 1860s of the transatlantic telegraph cable connecting New York and London, the, first, the full potential of the new technology was realized. It was humankind's first means of instantaneous global communication at the mere touch of a finger. And at the moment of going global, Victorians went round the clock. The, the limited word per minute carrying capacity of the undersea cable necessitated its continuous operation to satisfy demand. And its unceasing operation 
prompted a similar adjustment at signaling stations. To remain competitive, news organizations would thereafter adopt an unprecedented, sorry, unprecedented vigilance into the night. Alongside the telegraph, railway services were expanded and sped up, and the greater rail distances necessitated the first widespread use of night trains and sleeper cars. More nighttime activity encouraged new urban lighting projects, which further opened up the wasteland of the nocturnal hours. That many Victorians imagined that all of this expanding and doing was creating insomnia is evinced by a profusion of contemporary references. It may perhaps come as no surprise, considering the domination of the internet and related media on our culture, that recent sleep research has developed, developed a cognitive hyperactivity hypothesis in which intense or intrusive mental activity rather than physiological activity is seen as the primary culprit in sleep onset insomnia. But the incompatibility of sleep with hyperactive thinking was widely identified in Head's day in the Victorian period. It is well known, one prominent 19th century professional confidently asserts, that mental activity is the great opposer of sleep. One commentator declares, quote, mental labor called into use before retiring is uh, to be as great an enemy of rest as the bustle and roar of every great city. What is usually meant by such references to mental activity is what we might today call conscious thinking or cognition rather than generally the synaptic activity occurring always in any living brain, whether asleep or awake. In other words, it was something over which most felt they could exert a modicum of control. Thus, doctors would encourage insomniacs to try to find some plan quote, some plan by which the tendency to mental activity would be lessened and a favorable condition for sleep secured. And a popular health magazine encouraged readers to seek a cure for sleeplessness in whatever means takes away thought. That varieties of thinking, reasoning, remembering, worrying, communicating, or even thinking about thinking are destroyers of sleep is today physiologically explained by the fact that they rely on and instigate a preponderance of beta brain waves that are indicative of waking consciousness. In the 19th century, however, prior to the invention of the electroencephalogram and the identification of brain waves, physiologists studying sleeplessness focused on, among other things, the presence of blood in the brain, which was brought about by thinking. Prior to the mid-19th century, the consensus among physiologists was that an increase of blood in the brain actually encouraged sleep, that pressurized blood physically pressed against the organ, the brain, and, and rendered it insensible and dormant. Thus, intense mental activity in causing blood to flow to the head was often thought by that physiology to be a natural soporific. In fact, uh, Erasmus Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin's relative, developed in the 1790s a rotating bed that was supposed to by centrifugal force, like, bring, bring blood into people's head and make them drowsy. <laughs> I wish I had one of those. Anyway. But sleep's hematological conditions changed in the 1860s when Hammond, uh, William Alexander Hammond, and another person, an Englishman named Albert Durham, independently, apparently, discovered the fact that the brain was relatively anemic in sleep not hyper any. Uh, they were, tr uh, they refined uh, animals and some willing humans, <laughs> or insane people, and, uh, <laughs> and discovered that the, the head, the brain was relatively bloodless in sleep. Uh, so they proposed that too much blood in the head, brought on by too much thinking, was uh, a primary material cause of insomnia this time. One of the most prominent American neurologists in the late 19th century, George Miller Beard, used this revised conception of the brain physiology as one rationale for his warning that modern life was deleterious to sleep and responsible for a host of related nervous ailments. Experiments show that when a person has his attention attracted even slightly, as with the reading of a book, the bulk of the blood in the brain increases. With this experiment before us, let us consider the heightened activity of cerebral circul circulation made necessary since the introduction of steam power, the telegraph, the telephone, and the morning newspaper. Thus, when the, the new physiology of the anemic sleeping brain became more widely adopted by professionals, 
the perceived effects of intense mental activity were generally reversed. And again, it is perhaps not uncoincidental that at this moment, the dis that at the moment of this discovery, a spike in cases of insomnia began to be logged. For now, a vicious circle seemed inevitable. If mental activity stirred up blood, and too much blood in the brain caused insomnia, then whenever one worried that one would get insomnia, that mental act of worry would itself cause more blood to flow to the organ in question and exacerbate the very condition that one had worriedly wished to avoid. And even if the hematological physiology was wrongly imagined, even if this bloody brain could be assumed to be, as by our current physiology, a rather primitive account of how slumber sets in, the mere fact that the Victorians believed in it was sufficient for the psychological implications of this imagined physiology to take root. For recall how insomnia often arises on a perceptual mechanism and the power of suggestion. If one thinks that one might be in store for a restless night by whatever physiological uh, or emotional or medical rationale, even if the materials or dynamics are based on incorrect assumptions, still they will tend to provoke sleeplessness. <clears throat> but let us uh, consider an entirely different mental physiology, one arguably more attuned to the Victorian zeitgeist, given that hematological accounts of thinking and of sleep are as, at least as old as Aristotle. If we linger a, a bit longer over Head's quote, we now discover an outmoded or more strictly Victorian way of thinking about thinking. For along with our nervous functioning, intense mental activity is here conceived as resulting from, or indeed as being, a kind of work energy. The nervous and mental force of man is quantified and measured against steam and lightning, evinced, evincing a thermodynamic account of our mental physiology. The emphasis Victorians placed upon thermodynamics, the study of relations between forms of energy, electrical, thermal, chemical, and their conversion, conservation, and work efficiency, is manifested today in some still used Victorian era expressions, <clears throat> brain power, willpower, blow off steam, and the now obsolete brain work and brain worker. Under the influence of thermodynamic ideas, Victorians came to imagine that the forces driving all their thoughts and actions were roughly equivalent, convertible with those in nature and the industrial landscape, and sub subject to the same physical laws. It is therefore indicative of this new self-conception that the intense mental activity in Head's quotation is so closely linked to steam and lightning, for the forces coursing through Victorians' brains were thought to be essentially indistinguishable from those in the industrial environment of coils and wires and engines, the same technolog technologies they invented and in which they continued to be invested and involved. In the wake of this thermodynamic account of mental activity, or what Victorians called brain work, Electricity became the new animating spirit of humanity. Quote, every movement, look, or gesture, every sensation of pain or pleasure, every emotion, however transient, and perhaps every thought unexpressed is most assuredly accompanied by the disturbance of electromotive forces, one contemporary commentator gushes. With the rise of this sense of electrified thinking, an analogy soon came to be made in the Victorian imagination between people's neurological workings and the electric telegraph. This telegraphic analogy might seem rudimentary to us today with our more detailed understanding of synaptic plasticity, neurotransmitter vesicles, and axon terminals, but it still was endorsed by Emil Dubois Raymond, Hermann von Helmholtz, and other leading scientists, <clears throat> for it was generally considered to be, in a complex variety of ways, remarkably apt. Both systems, telegraphic and nervous, consisted of main lines and tributary branches. Both worked bilaterally. Just as telegraphic messages could be sent and received, our nerves could convey sensory information from the physical wor world to our brains, as well as deliver motor instructions from the brain to our body. And of course, both systems coursed with electricity which gave the impression, at least, of an instantaneity or simultaneity of communication. The analogy consolidated these diverse aspects into a single, concrete, and highly visible model, allowing anatomical fundamentals to be conveyed even in a children's book. Nerves pass from the brain and the spinal marrow to every part of the body. They may even be compared to wires of an electric telegraph. Did you ever see such wires? By the electricity which passes along them, the motion of a handle at one end will instantly ring a little bell a hundred miles off and more. 
This telegraphic analogy was atypically suggestive because it was more than an analogy. The telegraph was a model, even an extension of our nervous system. Bular here presaged what philosopher Mark Marshall McLuhan would famously describe a hundred years later, the telegraph's outering or extension of people's central nervous system into a simultaneity of experience. This nervous extension not only is meant not only metaphorically, but literally, for the device is, after all, a form of media, one of McLuhan's extensions of man. By means of the telegraph, the brain signal that commands our hand to pick a cup off the table, for instance, is given far greater, greater reach. It can command instantly the picking up of cups a hundred or a thousand miles away. Our self-conceived inner physics is reified into an external, more distant us with full plenipotentiary powers able to act on our behalf. McLuhan cites this telegraphic extension to drive home the idea for which he is most famous, that the medium is the message. That irrespective of what our media is used to say, it can exert a new scale or pattern into human affairs. In other words, the communicative content to pick up this or that cup is trumped by an overarching message, that the instant commanding of distant, distant cups is now within our grasp, and that the scale and pace of our volitional involvement with the world has entered a new, revolutionized, augmented paradigm. So what was the message of the telegraph and this telegraphic nervous system? This is from Schoolhouse Rock, by the way. <laughs> After the successful deployment of the transatlantic cable in 1866, one might assume its message was that a New York early morning was now London midday, and that a London late evening was now a New York afternoon, that the natural measured vacillations between nocturnal and diurnal life in North Atlantic urban centers was being reconfigured for the transatlantic cable ushered in the era of round-the-clock global communication. Suddenly, the electric wires that extended our sensory, or sensory organs and wills and thoughts were always open for business, so to speak, perpetually crisscrossed with instant personal and commercial transactions. One might be tempted to assume, therefore, or furthermore, that such a message, disseminated by an atypically suggestive telegraph operating throughout the night likely was atypically problematic for insomniacs whose disorder was both particularly suggestible and particularly contingent on the status of the nocturnal hours. It soon became clear that unlike pre-modern or agrarian societies, technological modernity quite literally needed constant supervision. Law enforcement, emergency services, and religiously minded moralists had long developed the rhetoric of perpetual vigilance, but the telegraph and the railway facilitated and further ne necessitated a new nocturnal regime of hypervigilance. Amid the rise of these machines, the cause of personal morality, social res the causes of personal morality, social responsibility, and public safety overlapped. We see, for instance, how the demands of a technological society allowed temperance groups to inject new urgency into their appeals for public sobriety. When an English railway telegraphic signal man was caught neglecting his duties for a 2 a.m. drunken carouse, anti-alcohol activists bemoaned how, quote, the safety of so many thousands of lives depends upon the activity, the vigilance, and the thoughtfulness of individual members of the railway force, adding that it is alarming, alarming to reflect what mischief might be done if the discipline of our railway lines were to become seriously and extensively relaxed. Of course, neither a drunken carouse at 2 a.m. nor the societal vigilance to protect against them are, technically speaking, instances of insomnia. To remain consistent, we must always require insomnia to manifest a thwarted will to sleep. It seems, though, that there is an implicit telos of slumber hidden in this rhetoric of vigilance, that if the objectives of the temperance movement were ever met, the railway riding public would likely sleep more soundly. For it is well documented that the physical and psychic trauma of railway disasters caused by the inattentiveness of such signalmen often led to actual medical, medically diagnosed cases of insomnia, as did people's fears that the impossibility of perfect perpetual vigilance uh, meant that more catastrophes 
would be inevitable. So my book goes on to talk about quite a bit of literature. So this is kind of a preparatory that didn't really go into much uh, in terms of Victorian literature. But I do talk quite a bit about um, Charles Dickens and how he was involved in a uh, train crash in 1866. I think off the top of my head, it's the Staplehurst Rail Disaster. And here we see Dickens <coughs> rescuing people from the wreckage. Um, after this accident, he suffered from insomnia. He couldn't sleep anymore, and he felt like the, the collision actually shook his sensorium, his, uh, his nervous system, so much that it kept kind of vibrating through the night, keeping him awake. And he went on to write a, um, a short story called The Signal Man, or The Haunted Signal Man. And I talk a bit about that as well. Um, and earlier in my paper here, I describe how um, technology is, is kind of paradoxical and that it represents our attempts to kind of further convey our will and how that um, kind of also thwarts our will sometimes. Uh, that's the double logic of the technological prosthesis that some theorists have talked about. But anyway, in, in Dickens' uh, story here, it's very evident that that is the case because it's the signalman, it's precisely his over-attention to his job that undermines his ability to do his job. Um, he's so focused on being a signalman and so obsessively focused on um, carrying out his duties that he ends up kind of going crazy, uh, staying up all night with because uh, he's, he's, he's working the night shift. That kind of monomania drives him to hallucinate and uh, cause a train disaster by his own, like, kind of... It's the hyperattentiveness that leads to inattentiveness because he starts to no longer be able to distinguish between attending to actual things and imaginary things. So it's an interesting read. Um, I guess I could end it now. I have more to talk about, but uh, <laughs> should I keep, should I talk about one more thing? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, so far I've, I've mainly been talking kind of about physical things um, and how the telegraph and the exigencies of the onset of, of telegraphy, telegraphy, especially transatlantic telegraphy, uh, caused this kind of new hypervigilance. Um, but one of my chapters also talks a lot about uh, associationism, the doctrine of associationism, and how um, people in the 19th century would, like James Mill, um, promoted an associationist idea that if you that are, we're not really in control of our thoughts. That you know, if I if I see a cup, I think of water. If I if I see water, I think of a river. That everything is associatively linked in our minds, and some uh, theorists thought that insomnia is a consequence of this doctrine of, associ of associationism superimposed upon technological modernity. So this is going to sound kind of crazy, but <laughs> in prior centuries, uh, life uh, vacillated more so between moments of activity and inactivity. After nightfall, things kind of went quiet. Um, but when, with the onset of technological modernity, as I describe it, with the telegraph and the railway, um, that that dichotomy, um, that periodicity, was upset. So that, in a night, one might suddenly see things that will, you know, they'll hear a distant railway pass or, re or, or engine pass, and it'll stir up all kinds of associative links with other kinds of activity, and that associative uh, link will promote um, further wakefulness. And if that sounds a little bit of a stretch to us today, that, that these asso this associative uh, way of thinking could, could actually spark insomnia, let me give an example <laughs> from a uh, popular London magazine from the 1870s, 1868. Um, Consider something like the story Sounds in the Night, 1868, from a popular London society magazine. It illustrates a technologically active environment instigating a hyperactive, sleepless association of ideas. The story's narrator first attributes his sleeplessness to too much brain work. 
then describes how when he tries to sleep in his country house just outside of London, impressions of the distant city's technologies invade his bedroom's silence, initiating and perpetuating his obsessive mental associations. First comes the sound of a speeding night train. Quote, listening attentively, I hear clear and shrill the scream of the railway engine as it plunges beneath our tunnel. That is the 2.35 up express, I mentally say to myself. 2.35 a.m. up express, I mentally say to myself. Yet it, is not this, this in, yet it is not this engine's scream itself that keeps the narrator awake thereafter, but the train of thoughts that it inspires. Immediately he begins to reflect on his own former railway journeys. He imagines the busy round-the-clock comings and goings of other railway travelers. Quote, how odd to think of the light activity and bustle there at this unearthly hour, and all still and motionless here at home, unquote. His mind, however, is anything but, quote, still and motionless, unquote, for he continues to make associations. He imagines the excitement of, elop <coughs> of elopement by train. He thinks of a business traveler summoned by electric telegraph who might either be racing to a loved one's deathbed or making an escape as a fugitive flying from justice. These thoughts of racing, flying, and deathbeds then seem to evoke in him anxieties of human mortality and the fleeting nature of time, for he immediately thinks of the loud ticking of his watch. More temporal associations come. He muses how mere seconds might determine the outcome of a race and the fate of a gambling man's fortune. He thinks of people's hurry and worry to catch trains. Then his clock strikes three. Throughout all of this, the author, as narrator, seems quite self-conscious of his performance, explicitly remarking on the intellectual hyperactive condition he describes as an example of, associ of associationist psychology. Quote, I do not wonder that metaphysicians have dwelt so carefully on the subtle laws of association, how a, how a casual sound awakens a mental association and at the touch of this association, the burial places of memory give up their dead. The sleepless hour is indeed the time for memory. Okay, I guess that'll be... That's just a, a little sample of... Thank you. Any yeah. I work on some of these issues so very Wonderful. I, um, have lately been thinking about attention and distraction. So I guess my question, thinking about the kinds of things that Jonathan Ferry has written about mm -hmm. and um, recent research that's shown, oh, that's kind of investigated the fact that um, say in the early modern period, it was common to have two sleeps, right? And that people would be awake for various kinds of activity in the middle of the night. Have you? And that there were numerous uh, references here, including Shakespeare's insomnia. Um, have you come upon a way of framing what it is about? being awake at night that becomes a problem as opposed to um, just a fact. <laughs> um, and it, it seems to have something to do with the with labor yeah. and the work day yeah. and the necessity that one sleep in these times because these other times are given to... So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, you know, I don't talk about the segment of sleep pattern as much because I, I discuss kind of what happens after the segmented sleep pattern gets abolished. Right. Uh, and I guess I could argue that insomnia is kind of a result of not having that. What we're talking about, uh, some theorists have talked about how in the 18th century, kind of pre-modern, pre-industrial modern times, or earlier, uh, that we slept um, for a few hours from like 11 or from 10 to 1 in the morning and then woke up for two hours and then went back to sleep for a few more hours. So there's this kind of awake at night. And you know, I don't know, I mean, it, it might be a little bit exaggerated the degree to which everyone did that. Um, maybe some people did it and it was talked about, but I, I'm not an expert on that per se. But, um, but I have heard people say that the onset of what you describe, like, you know, the work schedule and everything has been kind of industrialized and made much more rigid 
Um, you know, if you wake up, it really doesn't matter if you wake up at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. If you're just plowing your field, it's still there. But if you're catching a train, it's going to leave, and you'll miss it, and you'll be late for work. So, I mean, uh, industrial modernity makes us be more precise with our being awake and being asleep, and you kind of, uh, I'm sorry. Matters is it's like, is not it? I mean, it's these things in the rhythms of the year. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, I mean, that's Thompson's argument years ago, that link between time discipline and labor discipline have uh, I was going to ask, it's probably a historical question, um, is there an urban, is it seen as an urban problem more than a rural one? Yes, for and sure, yeah. And also the sociology of it, I was going to ask, mm -hmm. you were talking about different classes having more of a problem. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if you look in a, like, 1890 to 1910 uh, Encyclopedia Britannica entry on insomnia, it will say that uh, the, the laboring classes or the rural classes don't, don't suffer from insomnia because uh, you have to be a brain worker. And this was really a term that, that you know, separated, like, physical muscle workers from mental brain workers. And brain workers were, like, lawyers. Uh, accountants, uh, shipping clerks, and things like this, people worked, who worked mainly with their brains, and those people were the ones suffering from insomnia, whereas the people who were out in the fields kind of not working their brains. What about brains. the history of medicine? So what about pain? Because you share that picture of the spine, which I'm also familiar with mine, because many of those discs are you know, oh. gone. <laughs> and another reason why we get older, we can't sleep, is because we're in pain, and we can manage this more effectively now. But I've read, read accounts of my own people have chronic pain. Back pain. Yeah. As I have, I can take a pill for it. They can't, you know. Right. That's the reason why people often can't sleep. Is is that discussed anyway? You know, I actually, I mainly focus on this kind of paradox of, of of will. So it has to do with like the the um, the paradox in the degree to which our willing undermines our will in insomnia. Right. Um, so it's more of a maybe a psychological uh, account rather than these kind of. Uh, they're beginning to develop new treatments for pain, aren't they, in the 19th century? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's something I kind of neglected a little bit on the, the pain, but I have heard um, that as well. Yeah. So, is, is psychosomatic insomnia then just separated from some physiological pain? Yeah, well, I would argue actually that. <clears throat> And I don't know. <laughs> I mean, in today's terms, I'm not an expert on insomnia. I mean, ex I'm an expert on historical insomnia. But um, I would almost argue, based on my reading, that insomnia is psychological. Um, and that the other things that keep us awake are just things that keep us awake. Like I say how uh, if, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a sensation, like if a pain or a phone call wakes you up, um, a non-insomniac would have no problem just turning over, you know, after, after that stimulus has subsided, a non-insomniac would have no problem going back to sleep. But an insomniac would psychologize or, or fixate on, on that more than a non-insomniac. So it, it always has to do with some kind of feedback loop or vicious cycle of cerebration or of cognition or something. Yes? <laughs> And maybe what was about that sort of non thing you were being fruitful or inspiring and useful rather than just. Yeah, that's my last chapter. Because <laughs> I talk about how the modern. Most of my book is about Victorian, but I do bleed over into the, the modernist poets uh, and, and some artists, Marinetti um, and a little bit of Ezra Pound and, and T.S. Eliot who use this, uh, like, trope of nervousness and wakefulness uh, as a means by which to be creative. Like, artists are, and, and inventors tend to be insomniac because they're just so busy with their little thoughts that they can't turn that off or go to sleep. So, so much... Actually, one of my main points is that this modernity that we blame for sleeplessness <coughs> is actually a result of sleeplessness. It's not the cause, it's the effect of sleeplessness. Like, think of how many inventors, Thomas Edison w had his little insomnia squad, it was called the insomnia squad. They would be up all night inventing mo modern technological mo modernity. And so it's, it's as much as the effect of sleeplessness and all of its 
technological and artistic creations that came out of, of sleeplessness. Would you go so far as to say it became fashionable? Or oh yeah, it very much became fashionable, yeah. Like, it, it, you, when, you became, when you called yourself an insomniac, you became a, a peer of eminent persons. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, you know. <laughs> but it's also associated with sort of yeah, underworld activity. Insomniacs roam the streets at night. Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. They do engage all sorts of threatening behavior. So yeah. I'm just, I mean, I really have two, one, just, that's just a comment. I'm wondering if that's you That's true. Like no, uh, James Thompson's uh, City of Dreadful Night. Right. Um, and T.S. Eliot, you know, they run into people like spilling out of corsets, I think Eliot says. You know, prostitutes and the underbelly, the underworld. I think it's interesting how mechanistic all of these things are in terms of cause and effect. You know, it's about wiring. It's almost like they're, they're basing it on a model of the telegraph, which, by the way, the Crimean War had telegraphs. So they must have laid cables in Europe before they did across the Atlantic. Yes, yes. No, I, I didn't mean to. Right? I didn't mean to suggest that. Yeah, that that no, transatlantic sure telegraph. History, but I'm just well, saying, don't you think a little bit. There's a. There's a um, you know, the, the, the sort of form, the it's sort of like the way we talk about our brains today is being hardwired for something, but we're mm -hmm. borrowing the metaphor from, you know, the technological hardware. Mm -hmm. um, is there a sense, do you get, about the way the telegraph works, that that's somehow, because the telegraph's about impulses and stashes and all that, and the goal on cables, which could be analogous. Yeah, no, I, there, it, it's very similar. I mean, yeah. yeah, today we talk about whether or not we're compatible with someone or something. It's a technological metaphor used from... Uh, computers. Uh, back then, when when they started making these technological metaphors with with our will and our you know our will is just a an impulse signal, an electric right. signal from the telegraph. Then they talk about how our will is not you know before the telegraph metaphor, people thought of the will as a unified thing. Like we had this kind of well, we I mean well they, they I mean it goes really back to Descartes, right. where you have uh, Cartesian duality. You have like, the mind, which is a unified thing, and then bodily things. Uh, so. With the advent of the, t the telegraph metaphor, our mind, our will, becomes like these little pulses. Right. It's like no longer like this, me yeah, so. But, okay, my final thing, and this really quick, yes. is that, um, so I'm wondering, given that, how much is influenced Freud's thinking? Um, about the unconscious and, and the sort of, the associative thinking stuff really got me, you know, yeah. about that. So, did you go up through? Well, yeah, in the, in the sense that when I just, what I just said, like, the, the will became, pulse signals and not like a, a unified thing, that kind of presages a lot of ways in which throughout the 19th century the self was no longer solitary, right. it's no the longer singular. No longer right. So that brings you to yeah. James and, and that brings you to Janet and James and, and Freud right. and those people. And then I'll tell you that I have to correct the compatibility that's not computer. That's not computer. Oh, the, 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 the um, we used to talk about being compatible. Oh, compatible? That's, that's pre-computers? Oh, really? What's that from? I'm old enough to have dated before. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I'm sure there were computers. We're not compatible, so yes. Well, yeah, what was the com that's, that's, uh, but I don't Do you know the origin of that, compati compatibility? I don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, uh, we, we invent epistemologies, don't we? And that would be an unfortunate one to slip in. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> not all my etymologies are... That's the hardwired stuff. That stuff makes me nuts. The other stuff yeah. Well, no. There, there, there are the etymologies of like yeah, blow off steam is from the steam the Victorian period. So the is not with yeah. Oh, good. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll revise that. Have you read the, the uh, uh, Creative Malady? That's a, a book that uh, talks about people being ill so that they can have time to create. Right. Yeah. Uh, 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 who who wrote that? Um, Okay. It sounds like so, something I should read. Yeah. <laughs> Nietzsche was a chronic. Yeah. And and a Browning. Okay. Great. Uses literary figures as examples. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely something in this in this general area. Yeah. Great. Must have overlooked that one. <laughs> yes. Um, when you talked about the assessment. Yeah. And, and you mentioned links. Uh -huh. I got me thinking about you know, surfing the net and following those links. And um, at the beginning of your lecture, um, you talked about um, how we look at the modern world currently um, in terms of these same ideas. And then you took us to, and you said your expertise is focused on the brain here. Do you ever kind of 
bring us back to modern times or talk about the implications of, I mean, do you make a connection between all these interesting historical, is it just like, oh, isn't that funny we used to think like that back then too? Right. Having the same critique of our current modern life? Yeah, I mean, I, the critique is very kind of long-winded. I mean, <laughs> I, I can't answer that quickly, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I make, um, well, on the one hand, I, I think it makes us not worry so much about technological effects now, maybe. Because if I say, okay, people suffered from insomnia 150 years ago, and they, they turned out okay because we're their descendants, um, then maybe we shouldn't worry so much about these psychosomatic effects of media saturation today. But I also am concerned about the psychosomatic effects of media saturation today. So there's a bit of a ambivalence there. I don't know. But yeah, I, I, read the book and you'll find out <laughs> what, what, I, what I say about all this. Yes. <laughs> you know, of course, I, I wish I had the book you know, three days ago, and then I would have it here, but those things never work out. Yes? Uh, I wonder if your metaphor shifts at the end of the 19th century when uh, the uh, theories of the mind start to emerge and the acknowledgement of the unconscious, you know, with James and Charcot and even Freud in the you know, 1890s, um, because, of course, uh, this unitary notion uh, starts to split to different cells, uh, conscious, unconscious. Uh, and so the metaphor uh, for the influence of insomnia somehow uh, you know, breaks fragments or breaks up from the Victorian mold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a chapter devoted to a person that's kind of not often talked about, named um, Joseph Mortimer Granville, who, if you've seen this movie Hysteria, um, about, the about the dildos, yes. <coughs> Joseph Mortimer, Mortimer, Mortimer Granville is remembered today only for uh, the invent, being the inventor of the vibrator and for appearing in this movie as the inventor of the vi vibrator. And, uh, Hysteria came out in 2011. Um, Anyway, but he, uh, apart from inventing the, uh, the vibrator, uh, he um, was interesting in that he took what is usually seen as uh, the Jamesian and Charcotian and Freudian splitting up of the ego. And he actually applied it to sleep and insomnia. Because before it was just like there was one sleep and there was one insomnia. You, you were either asleep or awake, you were either insomniac or asleep. Um, but this guy, Granville, uh, split it up into multiplicities of like, well, you can be kind of viscerally asleep and uh, your left earlobe could be awake. Or, you know, it was, it was like you, and that kind of brought us to a new stratum of worry. Like, what if, you know, what if my, my visceral consciousness didn't get enough sleep? Or what if my, my judgment didn't get enough sleep? Or, you know, so he made things even more confusing, and something the subject of more yet more worry. So is, does that kind of relate to your question about this, the atomization of the self? Or the I mean, I just, I just think the acknowledgement of the unconscious and the lack of will you know, control over our right. thoughts. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was very unsettling to a lot of people, and they looked at force. they looked at insomnia as kind of a, a, a pr proof of that this lack of will that you know. Uh, so they're saying that there's no longer this kind of Cartesian will, and hey, that does make sense because I don't seem to be able to control myself into sleep or corral myself. Uh, yes? So what is the suggested treatment for insomnia other than trying to get more or less blood flowing through the brain? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you just get in that spinning bed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a guy like, list. I catalog tons of different proposed treatments, and one of my points is like there's so many treatments that that might have even led to yet more insomnia yeah. in worrying about whether you're doing the right treatment or doing the treatment rightly. Or uh, yeah, tons of drugs and. Yeah, and that was another problem because. You know these really rad these really strong, powerful drugs, soporifics and hypnotics were like 
last resort for people who just couldn't sleep at all. But it was those people who were like the most judgment impair impaired. And so often they would overdose on their drug because they wouldn't know when to stop taking it. Or, and and uh, what's the, what's the um, Age of Innocence? Is that the book that? No, House of Mirth. House of Mirth. The person, uh, Lucy, dies of an overdose of chloral or laudanum. Lily. Lily. Thanks. <laughs> I don't talk about that much, but I mention it. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if you found any evidence of people being concerned that uh, these technologies were saturating the air in a physical and not just a psychological way. Especially with radio and the sense of there being wireless. My, my partner works in video games and he said to me one night, well, you shouldn't sleep with your phone by your head. And I was like, well, why not? I have like white noises on there. So it helps me sleep. <laughs> like, there's all kinds of... I'm just speaking in layman's terms, you know, he's like, there's a lot there's of... There's nastiness out there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I never, I don't think about wavelengths. I do now. So <laughs> I know, I know. And I worry when I see, like, pregnant women, like, with their laptops on their bellies, working away, I'm like, what are you doing? My wife, for instance. Anyway, yes? In that quote that you put up a few times, um, Franklin... Franklin, Franklin Head, yeah. There's also a part about... Um, the desire for fame and wealth and competition and, and sort of these other sort of social things, aspects capital, yeah sort of competition that sort of did that turn up in other places too where this idea of like an obsession with either a sort of greed or a sort of um, yeah um competition uh, gk chesterton talks a lot about he, he describes like money pursuit pursuit of money as being an insomnia uh, like capitalists in their race for fame and wealth or whatever uh, they suffer from insomnia. Not just that they really suffer from insomnia, but that as a metaphor, like that is, an, that is a kind of insomnia like this. Um, and there's others that I can't think of right off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, this kind of careerist competition, never being satisfied, um, there's a bit of that. That killed Michael Jackson, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did it really? Did he, did he have it? Yeah. And, and then again, he was so highly medicated that. Oh wow! <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, John Tyndall is another uh, person from the Victorian period that was like, uh, you know, prominent inventor who died from insomnia. Medicate, exact same thing. Medicate over medication of his insomnia. I use him as a lot in the first few chapters as kind of a. A story that ends bad, but uh, so it's interesting given this history that you know Ambien is now accused of you know also making people lack the will. They do stuff to sleep that they don't mean to do, and drive a car, and have an affair, and make chocolate chip cookies, whatever. Um, which is you know the number one. Yeah. For Ambien, yeah. Anyway. The will is very interesting. I'm sorry. I'm, I hope I'm not going too far over. Oh, it's it's one. Thing. Um, yeah, I do talk about the will a lot, and uh, like Ambien, um, <clears throat> in the late 19th century, there was also like hypnosis and uh, suggestive, like auto-suggestion was another prominent like cure for insomnia. Like, you know, your doctor would basically just sit there and say, you are going to sleep tonight. You are, you know, <laughs> or you would, you would have a script and you would say that to yourself, like, I will sleep well tonight, as auto-suggested. And that was both seen as, you know, an effective sleep-seeking strategy, but also it was seen as, like, just making the will all the more um, amenable to manipulation from outside forces, or, you know, like, if you were a person who needed to go through that, then you were obviously a person who didn't have a very strong will to begin with, and that, that crutch was just making your will less, not more strengthened, or, yeah. You talked about meditation. It seems to me that meditation throughout the years has been uh, talked about as a way to control without control. Yeah. Uh, medica meditation in uh, today's sense, like, there's this new fad of, like, mindfulness. Yeah. Um, I kind of I say something that, I mean, I don't know. It, a lot of emphasis has been placed in our distractible, distracted society of Twitter and tweets and feeds and things like this, that uh, that we have become begun to valorize uh, like 
focus and meditation and mental calm. And, uh, but in my way, I always kind of like, you know, find problems in what the solution is otherwise prescribed as being. So I actually see like sometimes if you overly focus, like, the, like Dickens' character, if you overly focus, if you're too, you know, undistracted, you actually become narrow uh, and it's, it can, that too can lead to problems. That too can lead to insomnia. I mean, there's an insomnia from distractibility and distractedness, but also from over-focusedness. It goes in a lot of directions. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>